Hello, YA. If you stand to your feet, we're gonna just take a second to just say thank you.
141 verse 2, David writes, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So there's this flower called a moon flower, and as the name suggests, it's a nocturnal flower. And this means, as you, as you might have guessed, that it blooms in the evening, its petals open up in the evening, and in the morning when the sun begins to hit it, the petals close. There is a kind of moonflower that has a lemony scent whenever the petals are open, is, is what I read. So that means that there is an aroma, there's an incense, if you will, that you can only smell when it's dark. So if you are seeking to worship the Lord and please the Lord, but you're in a dark place, 
don't be discouraged. You've actually been teed up beautifully. There's something special about worshiping when things are hard, when things are tough. When things are going well for you, it's natural. It's natural to thank the Lord and praise the Lord, and that's great. But when it's not so easy, it's a special kind of worship. As you know, there are lots of things in our lives, lots of circumstances that we can't control. Even there are things in ourselves that we have a hard time controlling. So if I can give you a little tip, begin with controlling what you can. For example, your words, you choose what you say. So if things aren't going your way and you don't feel like saying it, praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you can change your physical posture. Things aren't going your way, you can get on your knees, you can raise your hands and you can praise the Lord. And this costs something. It costs something when it's uncomfortable. It takes faith and this is a blessing to the Lord. Lord, I just thank you so much. I just acknowledge your presence and your goodness, Lord. I thank you that you're here, you're moving, you're interrupting the plans of the enemy, Lord. I thank you that you're doing good things, God. I just pray, Lord, that you would put it in our hearts to seek to please you. It says very plainly in Ephesians 5.10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So Lord, put that in our hearts. Give us a desire to please you, Lord. And I pray especially for those who are in a dark place, God. Give them courage, give them umph to praise you anyways, even when it hurts. In Jesus' name, amen. What's up, guys? How are y'all? There aren't really any official announcements. Um, there will be pizza after service, so please hang out with us and uh, listen to my beautiful wife preach. Let's go. Revelation 12, 10 through 11. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Seven places Jesus shed his blood. The blood in his sweat, the stripes on his back, the bruising, the crown of thorns, pierced hands, pierced feet, and the spear in his side. Hey guys! What's up? I am so excited to share my testimony with you guys today. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Pastor Brandon and Krista for giving me the opportunity to share my testimony. Um, if you didn't know who I was already, my name is Josie Huffman, um, and I have the complete honor and privilege of leading worship here at Celebration Church. Um, and what a team, that worship, come on. Thank you, Lord, for your hand on our team. Um, anyway, so we're in a sermon series, um, as you can see, the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. And I just wanted to go over our launching scripture. You just heard it, but it never hurts to hear the word of God again. So we're going to turn to Revelation 12. I'm actually going to read 10 and 11 because verse 10 is my favorite part. Um, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Praise God. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Praise God. Um, so just really quick before we get into my testimony, I do want to give a little bit of a warning, a little bit of a, hey guys, this is what we're about to get into. My testimony involves an abusive relationship. It got a little bit sexually abusive as well. I'm not going to get into like that completely, um, but there is a little bit of a space to where 
right before that that I think is really important. Um, that being said, I understand that there's probably a couple camps in the room, a couple of people here um, that at the mention of abuse in any way, you're probably a little bit guarded already. Um, and I just pray, listen, I'm a mom. Let me mother you really quick. Um, I need you to hear me. Um, we just read that we have the blood of the lamb. This is the power of my testimony, and hopefully by the end of this, we'll be able to overcome some things. Um, and there's also probably some people that at the thought of relationships, you're like checked out, whether this isn't the season of your life that you're looking for a relationship, or maybe you're in a relationship and you're like, I don't need to know any of this. I'm good. Just hear me out, please. Um, I just believe that the Lord has just given me a download just for everybody in the room. So without further ado, let's get into my testimony. So my testimony starts around late 2019. I was kind of in this space in my life to where I'd never had a boyfriend before. And I was like, you know, this could be fun. Like, I could be a girlfriend. I could have a boyfriend. I could be in a relationship. And let me tell you, that is not the mentality that you need to have before getting in a relationship, literally at all. Um, and so that's just where I was at. And before we get into like the relationship part, there's just a verse that I really love. There's many verses that kind of regard uh, relationships and regard kind of like convictions and stuff like that. And this one is one of my favorites. Some of you may know it. If not, we're going to have it on the screen. It's 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Okay, let's take a breather yokes. What are we talking about? We're not talking about eggs, and we're not talking about some of y'all that go to the gym are, in, are just absolutely shredded. We're talking about oxen. We're talking about farms. We are talking about plowing fields here, and this is just like a metaphor that we see a lot in the Bible. And so pretty much back in the ye old Bible days, before we had those big old green John Deere tractors, we had oxen and yokes. And so pretty much they were like attached with another oxen. There was two oxen in the yoke and they would just plow the field together. And it seems fine and dandy, but what were to happen if one of the oxen decided that it didn't want to work that day? It was a little bit too tired. It stood up really late and it was just digging its hoofs in the ground. Like what would happen? The field wouldn't get plowed because one of them was in disagreement with the other oxen. And so pretty much what this verse is telling us is that when you're in a relationship with somebody, y'all need to be in agreement with each other. And so that is kind of my verse that I like to give to people when they're in relationships. I just think it's a very good basis, a very good launching point. And Josie Della in 2019 was not there. She knew the Lord, but she was not reading her Bible, so I didn't really have that one handy in my back pocket. Um, I didn't even talk about convictions with this guy. He wasn't even really going to church before me and my family, and that in and of itself is kind of a little bit of a red flag. But like I said, I'm in this space to where I really want a boyfriend, I really want to be in a relationship, so I'm like, okay, there's a couple things I know in this season of my life. I want a boyfriend, I want to be a girlfriend, I went to high school with this guy, so he like has to be a good guy, right? No. So it all started off very like normal. It all started off very like good, I guess. He started going to church with my family and I, and it just, to my knowledge at the time, was good. Like I said, I had never been in a relationship before, so what is my basis of good or not or healthy or not? And so slowly but surely, he started being a little bit like passive aggressive with his comments, a little bit sarcastic. And sarcasm isn't bad, I love a good sarcastic joke, but when it's like over and over and like the passive aggressiveness is like over and over and over and over and over again, you kind of get in this space to where you're like, at least I did. Like, dang, like am I really like, do I keep messing up this much? Like, like what am I doing? Like he keeps getting on to me. Like. If I don't get it together, like, he's going to leave me. Like, I'm going to blow this. Like, what am I going to do? And I started believing these things about myself that I was, like, stupid and that I was, like, not worthy. And in my mind, it was a very, like, fragmented picture of myself. But when you're in an abusive relationship, you kind of get into this mentality of, like, nobody else is going to put up with me. Like, he's doing me a favor 
by being in a relationship with me. Like, nobody else is literally going to put up with me. If I don't stay with him, I will be single forever. And so it kind of was there for a little bit, a little bit passive aggressive, a little bit sarcastic for a little bit. And then we just started arguing like crazy. And I, let me tell y'all, I'm an emotional gal. If I'm happy, I'm crying. If I'm excited, I'm crying. If I'm upset, I'm crying. If I'm mad, I'm crying. If I'm trying to communicate my emotions healthily, like any normal human, I'm definitely crying, okay? And so everybody else in my life just knows this about me. And so we would get in these arguments and I would start crying because I'm like so upset and I'm so like frustrated. And I'm like, I don't like, to me in my mind, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, why am I such a problem, this poor guy? And so I would start to cry. And of course, being in a manipulative relationship, um, he looks at me and this happened many times. He would look at me and he'd be like, oh, okay, so I'm the bad guy now. You're trying to make me look bad. You're trying to make this my fault, so you're going to start to cry. Okay, right, okay, I see what you're doing. And this would just destroy me further because that not at all was my intention. And he would tell me, like, you know what? You ruin the night because you started to cry. And we would have this conversation over and over and over and over again that I just got to the point to where I was just compliant in like little things, in big things. If we were trying to decide where we wanted to go to eat and I wanted Chick-fil-A and he wanted Rosa's, I'd be like, no, where do you want to go eat? He'd be like, Rosa's. Perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. And it's little like minuscule stuff like that. But just for as long as I can remember, I've had this conviction about alcohol. Um, and I just don't, I have just made a choice. The Lord has just given me a conviction that me and my husband just won't consume alcohol. And so he was aware of this, but he kept drinking anyways. And that is kind of when it gets into the conviction y, like we're not walking in agreement type of like disagreement. And so it just got really bad. We were arguing. We were fighting. It was just awful, very manipulative. Um, and this is kind of the point after a couple months to where it gets a little bit rough. Hang in with me. I'm not going to give you, like, I'm going to spare you the details, okay? But I started lying to my parents, which also is not a good thing. You should never lie to your parents. And we actually started coming to young adults, but, like, back in the day. And I loved young adults. I've always, always, always loved young adults. Back in the day, they used to have couches and donuts on a little pegboard, and it was great. It was so awesome, and I loved it, but he just didn't like it, and I would tell my mom, you know, I'm, I don't like to lie, but I was just in this point where I was like, you know what? If this is going to save me from an argument, then I'm just going to lie to my parents. Like, it's fine. It's really not that big of a deal, so back in the day, also at Young Adults, we would go out like to eat every Thursday. So we'd go to like Rosa's or Whataburger and we would like alternate. And I would like send my mom the schedule and I'd be like, okay girl, we're gonna go to a Whataburger after this. What if she would have pulled up? One thing about my mom, she's gonna pull up. And what if she did? What would, I, what would I have done? And so I'm just like not logically thinking at this point of like, I just wasn't even, that wasn't even an option. That wasn't even a thought in my mind. And so I'm lying to my mom. And so at this point he's like, hey, you should spend the night at my house. And I'm like, ooh, I don't really know about all that. But again, to avoid an argument, I'm like, hey, mom, so after I get out of work, I'm going to go spend the night at my friend's house. The friend that, like, I've been, like, I was spending the night at her house, but now I've, like, dragged this friend into my lie. And my friend has, like, no idea that I'm, like, using her name to lie. And that's just not okay because now I'm dragging my best friend into this. And so I tell my mom, hey, um, after work, I'm going to go spend the night at my friend's house, um, and then I'll be back in the morning. Like, they have stuff to do, so I'll be back. And she's like, okay, Miha, have fun. So I get over to his house, whatever. We're getting ready for bed. I'm picking up what he's putting down. I, I'm kind of, like, getting the vibes that he's, like, wanting to have sex. And I've kind of always had this, like, I'm going to wait until marriage I, that has just always been something to me that has been important. And so I'm like catching the vibe and I'm like, okay, I'm not really comfortable with this. Which by the way, you should always communicate. You should always have boundaries. Boundaries are okay and boundaries are healthy. And so I tell him, and I think I'm doing a good thing, which I was. And I was like, hey, um, 
I'm not comfortable with this. I really don't. Like, I kind of feel like you want to have sex, and I'm not really, like, there. Um, I'd had some experiences with men before that weren't really, like, as bad as this, but bad enough that I was, like, even then, like, I don't even want to, like, even if I didn't have this, like, I'm going to wait till marriage, those experiences kind of made me, like, ick to men, okay? And so I think that I'm being, like, a good girlfriend and communicating, and I'm like, listen, I'm not really there yet. Um, if this is something that you're wanting out of, a, out of this relationship, and I was aware that he had been in other relationships where they were, like, active. I'm like, if this is something that you're wanting out of me, then, like, I just don't know that I can, like, give this to you right now. So I, like, completely understand if you need time to, like, think things over. Um, I completely get it. I totally understand. But I'm just letting you know this is where I'm at. Like, I'm not comfortable with this. And, of course... It got silent, and I just learned that when things got silent, they were going to get bad. And I remember he goes, huh, wow, okay. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm about to get it. Like, I'm about to get in so much trouble. And he goes, okay, do you not know how much I love you? And I'm like, what? I love you so much. I, I can't believe that this is what you, this is all you think I want from you. I, I can't believe that this is all you think your worth to me. You're worth so much more. Your personality, dot, dot, dot. That's all he said. And I was like, okay. And he goes, you know, you're worth so much more. And I, I just love you so much. I just, I just love you so much. And I just can't believe that that's what you think of me. I just can't believe that this is the view you have. You know what? If I love you this much and you think that lowly of me, then maybe we should break up. Like maybe, maybe we're done. Maybe I'm not the guy for you, because if that's how you think of me, and I love you this much, I don't want to be with you. And of course, me being naive, me being 19, I'm like, no, please don't break up with me. And I'm like weeping, because at this point in my relationship with him, I was fully, like, we, he was kind of convincing me, like, hey, like, we're going to get married, we're going to have kids, da, 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 da. So I'm like, no, like, I can't. And again, remember, like, I'm under the impression that he's putting up with me, that nobody else is going to love me if he leaves me. So I'm, like, trying to fight for this, and I'm just, like, weeping, and I'm just destroyed. And I just remember, like, it got quiet, and he rolled over, and he just decided that he was going to have sex with me that night. Um, and I need you to understand that this happening one time, abuse like this happening one time is not okay. That's one time too many. Um, but for me, in my case, this was like a month long, like anytime he could get me alone, like I was being abused. This was like the worst like six months of my life. And so fast forward, we're kind of in the same, like just arguing all the time and this abuse is happening. And March 2020 rolls around. Do we all remember what happened? Extended spring break. And so at the time, like y'all remember, like some of y'all didn't get prom. Some of y'all didn't get a graduation. You got to drive through graduation. And you guys look back on this time kind of like, gosh, that really sucked. But for me, in this case, I was kind of like glad for like, the lockdown because I was getting distant from this man that was abusing me. And it's just funny how the Lord will use like situations that are seemingly bad because while I was growing distant to this man, I started becoming closer to the Lord. And I just remember like my little brother, Jordy, he has asthma. And so at the time we weren't really sure like what that meant, like he was considered high risk and my mom works in healthcare. And so we were taking like COVID so seriously, like we weren't seeing anybody. And I remember telling him like, hey, I know that you're still hanging out with your friends and Jordy has asthma. And what happens if you were to like hang out with these people, they're hanging out with people and then you hang out with me and then I bring COVID home and my little brother dies. Like that's just like, Y'all remember, like, that's just how unknown, like, March 2020, like, COVID was. Like, we didn't know, like, what was going on. Like, we thought the world was ending. Jesus was coming back. Like, we just thought it was done, over with. And so I remember communicating this to him, and he was just mad because, like, he couldn't, like, get me alone. And I remember, I will never forget this moment because it changed my prayer life literally forever. I was sitting with my dad. I love to talk to my parents. And I was sitting with my dad in his room, and I was like, Dad, 
I really need you to pray for us. Like, we're going through it. Like, we're arguing all the time. Like, it's just really bad, Dad. Like, like I need you to pray that this is going to work out. Like, he's telling me that I'm going to be, like, his wife and that I'm going to be, like, the mother of his kids. And I'm really trying to believe that. And I'm really trying to get there. But it's just hard. Like, I, I don't know what to do. And my dad looked at me. And some of y'all will get this. He looks at me in my eyes and he goes, Miha, if your parent ever hits you with a Miha or a Mijo, dude, just get buckle in. And so he goes, Miha. And I'm like, Yes, Dad. And he goes, Ugh, you need to be praying for God's will in this relationship. You do not need to be praying for your will. And I, just as I am now, I'm, I'm crying because I had never thought about it. And this, like, conversation changed my prayer life forever. And I remember being like, okay. And he was like, I'm going to pray for y'all, but I'm going to pray for God's will in this relationship. And my dad has always kept it 100. My dad has never sugarcoated anything. And he goes, 95% of the time when we're praying for our will for something it's just our will, and it doesn't align with the Lord's will. So you're praying for God to get in line with you. You're not praying to be in line with God. I was just blown away by that. And so I started praying this prayer, and I was like, Lord, I want you to do what you want to do in this relationship. I want you to do, I want this relationship to end how you want it to end. And as I'm praying this prayer, I'm like, sitting in my room and I'm like reading my Bible and I'm really like getting closer to the Lord and I'm like am I an abusive relationship and I'm like no 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 not me not me I've seen the movies like I know what to look for like no like I'm not that girl I'm not that girl no and I in fact was that girl and I remember I got this like feeling, and I now know that it was discernment, but I got this feeling to text this girl I had met at a birthday party like one time. And I think I only had her number because of like that birthday party. And I was like, hey girl. It was Sarah Dunlap. We love her. And I was like, hey girl. Um, sorry to bother you this evening. I think I'm in an abusive relationship and I really don't know what to do and I think I need to get out. And as a good friend, she's like, hey girl and again we're like not best friends I know that y'all have seen us around here that was not where we were at that time she's like random to me and again it was the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit knows that she's like this with the Lord and she's like hey girl I'm so sorry praying for you you need to get out of this relationship. And so I start like telling her what's going on and I'm like dude am I crazy? Like have I been the problem this whole time? And she's like no no like what are you talking about and this is a little bit of a sidebar your friends matter like they matter matter your circle matters when you bring something to your friends hey I'm going through this their automatic response should be I'm so sorry let's lay hands and let's pray for you let's just ask for a miracle, let's ask for healing, let's ask for deliverance, okay? And your response when your friends bring something to you should be, let's lay hands, I'm so sorry, we need to pray. And even when it's good things too, even when it's things to celebrate, praise God, like can we just thank God in this moment right now? Your friends matter. Jesus delivered me, Jesus healed me, but if I wouldn't have had Sarah, I literally don't know how long that healing would have taken, okay? So your friends matter. In these seasons to where, like, things are hard, you need a good, like, support system. And the Bible tells us that so many times. And the enemy's going to try and prevent that when you're in, like, a trial. He's going to try and isolate you. And I was isolated. I didn't tell my parents this was going on. I didn't tell my best friends that this was going on. Think about how many times when two three or more are gathered, go to your brother and confess your sins. Like this is stuff that's in the Bible. The enemy wants you to be by yourself and that's just not the truth. You need a support system. And so I'm like realizing that I need to break up with him. And I think that he's like catching on that I'm about to like end this. And so I text him one day before he goes to work and I'm like, hey, good morning. Can we talk whenever you get out of work? And he's like, no, like, I'm on my way right now. Like, we can just go ahead and talk right now. 
And I'm like, no, this isn't like a before work kind of conversation. Like, can you just please call me after work? So then he picks up the phone and he's like, what's going on? And I'm like, hey, nothing. Like, this is just like a conversation. Like, this isn't small talk. This is a conversation that I think we need to have after you get out of work. And he's like, okay, well, you can just call me whenever I'm, whenever I'm on lunch. Like, you can just come see me or, you know, like, you can just call me and we can talk about this. And I'm like, no, the Lord was giving me strength this day. That's all I can say. I was buckling down. And I was like, no, like, I'm not going to come see you and I'm not going to talk to you. We, we're going to talk after you get out of work. And I just told him, like, hey, I'm going to be unavailable for the rest of the day. At the time, I was just like, Everybody was home, so I was homeschooling my brothers, and I was staying home with my niece. Now, I'm just going to be unavailable for the rest of the day. Have a great day. See you later. And I hung up the phone. I put my phone in a drawer. I didn't look at it for the rest of the day. And I remember I just did my normal day-to-day COVID things, and me and my niece had taken a nap. And I remember when I woke up, I was like, let me check my phone. And so I opened my drawer, and I look at my phone, a plethora of text message voicemails, missed calls, and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, like, okay, like, I really got to commit to this now, because if not, like, I'm going to be in so much trouble, and that's not a mentality to have when you're in a relationship either, it's not, I'm going to be in trouble, is a whole other thing, okay, and so I remember like, okay, and he gets off work, and I go into my room, and I'm like, hey, and he's like, hey, what's up, we're making small talk, and then I'm like, hey, we got to talk. And he's like, okay. I'm like, I'm breaking up with you. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, no, yeah, no, I am. I'm breaking up with you. Like, this is, this is over. Like, we're done. And again, being like very like manipulative, he's like, no, 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 I can change. No, I know I've been mean to you. Like, I know that I haven't been the best, but I promise I'll change. Like, I promise I'll get better. Don't leave me. And I'm like, no, like, you're acknowledging that you know that you've been ugly to me you haven't changed in six months, like, I don't think that you're going to change, like, I'm just not doing this, and he's like, no, like, you're going to be the mother of my kid, you're going to be my wife, like, you can't do this, and I'm like, no, the Holy Spirit, I was probably in sweatpants, but if, you know, I had a belt on, a spiritual belt, and the Holy Spirit just yanked it tight, he's a buckle down, girl, and I said, no, 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 like, we're done, and I remember that it got silent again, and remember, Silence means destruction at this point in my life. And he goes, okay, you're going to break up with me. I'm not going to have a relationship with God anymore. I'm not going to go to church. I will not pursue the Lord. I will not have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not going to go to church. And it's going to be all your fault. This is going to be on you. And then it was silent. And I will never forget this moment because it was the first time I had ever heard the Lord's voice so clearly. And I only heard the Lord's voice like this two other times. This first time was to break up with this man. The second time was my call to ministry. And the third time was that Jonathan Huffman was going to be my husband. Amen. And I remember this silence. And I remember that the Lord said, so gently as he does, he said, I don't know how much more clear I can make this. He is not your husband. You need to leave. And I was like, oh, like I just heard the Lord's voice for the first time. So I'm like kind of tripping a little bit. And I'm like, okay, okay. And so I'm like, hey, listen, 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 listen. If there was even like a crumb of a chance of us getting together, if there was even like the slightest little bit of something for us to get back together, you just destroyed it. You just ruined it. Like you need to have a relationship with the Lord because you want to have a relationship with the Lord. You shouldn't be having a relationship with the Lord because like I'm going to church and my family's going to church. Like if this has been your heart the whole time, then like we're done. Like I'm done. I'm not going to be with a man that is like, pursuing the Lord just because of me, like, no, like, we're done, and it gets silent again, and he goes, okay, well, I hope that whoever you end up with treats you better than I did, and I hope that whoever you end up with, I hope that you just deserve him, and I just hope that he treats you better, and I hope he was a better man than I was, and I said, he will be, and he will treat me better, and I hung up the phone, I blocked him on everything, praise God, Praise God. 
And so I need y'all to understand that healing is kind of like linear. There's these like times to where like healing happens like instantly and healing happens like so quickly like this. And there's sometimes like when the Lord is healing you from something that it's gonna kind of take like a couple months and it might even take a year, might even take years. So for me at this point in my life, I'm out of the abusive relationship, but I'm not like healed from the trauma of that. And as I was prepping for this, the Lord kind of gave me this analogy of like, we've all been in like a house or we've like seen a house to where like somebody was like smoking in the house and it just like tears up the walls. And so the Lord was giving me this analogy that like my healing was kind of like this house. So like the smoker and the smoke, it was out of the house, but when you would like go up to the walls, there was like that like residual like ickiness and and that's where I was for months and that's not to say that like the Lord didn't heal me because the Lord brought me out of that relationship but there was still some healing that needed to take place and so you know whenever houses are like that you need a deep clean maybe you know scrape the paint off you know repaint and that's what the Lord did to me in the next couple months so I started coming back to young adults and I haven't left since then praise God and I remember I know we love this place I remember before I had ever got called to worship, before I had ever gotten my call to ministry, I have always loved worship. So after I had broken up with this man, I started seeing a therapist and I started seeing like a psychiatrist and I had gotten diagnosed with severe generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder and PTSD. Like that's like the triple, like the worst of the worst. And my PTSD had gotten so bad that I started to develop facial tics, which I didn't know was like a thing. And so I'm sitting in worship and Lyndon's probably like ripping it up there and I can't get into it because my face just like will not stop and I just got so fed up and because I had had a friend in the midst of the healing I knew how to pray over myself I knew how to like pray for healing and so I remember like I had my hand raised and I was like mad because I couldn't get into the song and I couldn't like worship the Lord and I remember that I put my hands like this and first second Timothy 1 7 says for God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control so in this moment of worship I'm sitting there and I'm like Lord I plead the blood of Jesus over my nervous system and over my mental health. And I'm like, Lord, I need you to step in. Anxiety, bow. Depression, bow. PTSD, bow. Because Jesus Christ is a healer. And let me tell you, this was like the instantaneous healing for me. Facial tics automatically stopped. Automatically stopped. The panic attacks stopped. The anxiety stopped. It all was gone. Praise God. And I was on four different medications because of this like situation in my life. I cut them cold turkey by the grace of God and because Jesus Christ is a healer, here I stand as a testimony that four years later, medication free. Praise God, praise God. And so last week, I did get healed from this completely. Last week, Pastor Brandon had mentioned patterns and he had mentioned cycles. And as you can imagine, being in a pretty like abusive relationship, like wanting to get back in a relationship was like not a priority for me. And I remember I'd gotten a prophetic word by Pastor Terry. And I remember he had like prayed something specific and I knew exactly what he meant. And the Lord was like, hey, you need to start praying. It had been like a year and a half, and he was like, you need to start praying like for a relationship. Like, Your heart needs to soften. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that again. And he was like, well, you just trust me, girl. Because at this point, like me and the Lord, we're in communion. We're chit-chatting all the time. And he's like, hey, like you need to listen to me, and you need to like pray for a relationship that your heart will soften. And I'm like, okay, I will listen to you. And wouldn't you know, A couple months later, Jonathan Huffman walked into my life. And I remember, like, before we had even started dating, we were having this conversation about convictions, and we were having this conversation about, like, hey, this is what the Lord has placed on my heart. This is, like, a vision I have for my family. And I remember, like, alcohol gets brought up. And he's like, hey, um, I just need to let you know, like, I'm not really sure, like, I can see my life without alcohol. And I was like, oh, word, oh, word. And I had already told him kind of what I had been through at this point, because we're, like, talking all the time. And so I'm like, okay, 
And as a girl in a car, what do I do when I'm upset? Turn. (laughs) Face the window. And so I'm like, turn like this. And it's just silent. We're in the Starbucks parking lot. And I'm like, God, what do I do? And he's like, okay, girl, you know the convictions I have given you. Because your convictions come from the Lord. So this isn't like something... It's like something that I want, but it's something that I know is going to benefit my family and me. So I'm like, okay, Lord, if you don't want alcohol, like alcoholism runs in my family. So I'm like, if you don't want this to be part of my life, I'm cutting it out. Like I serve the Lord. I don't serve man. So I'm like sitting and he's like, you know, the convictions that I've given you, girl, like say what you got to say. And I was like, okay. And he said, girl with grace. Please be graceful. If you know me, that's a little bit hard sometimes. And so I'm like, okay. And I remember I looked at him and I said, Jonathan? And he said, uh, yes. And I said, you don't have to pursue me anymore. We don't have to continue this. Because if that's the mentality that you're going to have, I don't want to be in a relationship with you. And I, I just know the vision that the Lord has given me. And I know what he has told me, me and my family are going to do. So this is the mentality that you're going to have. Like, I'm not going to do it. Like, you're asking me to settle. You're asking me to, like, lower my standards and lower my convictions, and I will not do that. So if this is what you're telling me, then, like, we don't even need to continue this. And because Jonathan honors the Lord and honors, like, my convictions, and we're kind of in this, like, mindset of, like, okay, well, your convictions are my convictions. Like, we need to start getting there. He hasn't drank alcohol since then. And that's kind of, like, these are the conversations that you need to be having, like, while you're dating, while you're, like, talking, whatever the people do nowadays. Um, And so these are the conversations you need to have. And let me give you some tough love. Let me mother you again. A man or a woman of God is not going to ask you to lower your standards or your convictions, Okay, you need to bring those convictions to them and say, this is what the Lord has told me. This is what we're going to do. And because the conviction is higher, like mine was alcohol. This is what we're doing. We're not drinking alcohol. Let me give you one better. If you are a man or a woman of God, you should not be asking your partner to lower their standards or their convictions. Okay, Amos 3.3 says, do two not walk together unless they have agreed to do so. So you need to be having these conversations. This is where I kind of get into like the relationship talk, what the do's and don'ts. Um, You need to be in agreement literally about everything. This is where we get back to the oxen, the being yoked and plowing the field together. You need to be in agreement and you need to be having these conversations because if you're not having these conversations while you're talking, while you're dating, while you're engaged, they're going to follow you into marriage. Once you get married, your problems just don't disappear. The Lord doesn't just like, okay, you guys are married, like fresh start. No, your dating problems turn into married problems if you do not talk about them. Guys, so this is why it's so important you need to be having these conversations with your partners, okay? And you need to ask the Lord, like, before you're even considering getting into a relationship, am I ready to be having these conversations? Am I really ready for what I'm asking for? And he's going to let you know, like, hey, me and you have been talking a lot, and I don't think you're ready for these conversations yet, but your season is coming, okay? I wish nothing more then that gyra would have came out in 2019. Imagine my season of singleness just singing that he is enough. Oh, I love that song. And some of y'all maybe just listen to that song whenever you're not really sure if you wanna be in a relationship or not. Moral of the story, talk to the Lord. Talk to him, am I ready for this? Am I ready to have these conversations? Is this my season? And Psalm 31, five, always remember this, as my dad says, (laughs) hold on. Psalm 31 15 actually my times are in your hands and so just remember that just because you think that it's your time to do something doesn't mean that it's the Lord's time for you to do something your idea could be in the right place like wanting to be in a relationship isn't necessarily a bad thing when it's done healthily but remember that the Lord is going to let you know like it's time like this is your person like you need to start moving this direction but that's not always the case, okay? And so that's kind of my spiel on relationships. If the band would like to come up, I'm about to close. Um, I understand that my testimony is a little bit of like a soft subject, whether it's like whatever kind of abuse in a relationship. And so I just kind of want to um, 
address maybe some people in the room who have been in a relationship like this. Um, I need you to know that Jesus loves you, and I need you to know that there is a grace that covers this part of your life and this specific trauma that you have experienced. There is just a certain grace that covers this, like, hurt, okay? Um, we get in this space, and I mentioned it, that I was thinking, like, maybe I am, like, stupid. Maybe, like, maybe no one else will love me. And that thought process can, like, follow you even when you're out of the relationship. But I need you to know that if Jesus isn't telling you that you're these things, you're not these things. He's not going to tell you that you're unworthy. So if Jesus isn't saying these things about you, you don't need to be saying these things about you either, okay? Jesus is telling you because he died for you. I died for you. I cared for you so much. Doesn't that make you chosen and worthy? If Jesus is calling you redeemed, if he's calling you made new, believe that of yourself. And it's not like an affirmation type of thing because then we can get kind of tricky into like new age stuff, but this is just what the Bible is telling us, that Jesus is telling us that we have a seat at his table. That doesn't sound like somebody who's like uninvited or unworthy to me, okay? And the enemy's gonna try and try and try and try and tell you like, no, 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 no. Jesus said that about this person. He didn't say that about you. Like this grace excludes you. And that's just not the truth, okay? Jesus died for you. Jesus died to cover this, okay? If you and Jesus are in disagreement, Jesus is not the one that needs to change his opinion. Jesus doesn't have opinion, Jesus has fact and we need to get in line. So if Jesus is telling you, daughter, daughter, you are worth more than rubies, you are worth more than jewels, then believe that because this is what his word is saying and his word is truth, okay? And I know that abuse isn't just like one gender and there could be some men in here that have gone through this and there's a grace for that too. There's a grace. First Peter 4.10 tells us, you know, because of the grace that the Lord has given us, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I was in this space where I was like, what am I gonna tell my husband? And I can't imagine like being a man that might've like experienced this before. Like, what am I supposed to tell my wife? Like, I'm, I'm a man, like I'm a dude. And there's grace for that. And we see here that ultimately like the gift that the Lord has given us was salvation, but in salvation there's grace and there's love. And because Jesus has given us these things, because he died and he gave us these, we give those to people. So there's a grace. And let me tell you that that conversation is so easy when it's the right person. When it's the person that the Lord has for you, hey, listen, this is something that I've been through. This is something that I've gone through. Wow. I can't believe that you've been through that and you're still at young adults. You're still serving. You still have a relationship with the Lord. I see you smiling, serving donuts. Praise God. Praise God that he can heal you and you can still have a relationship with him. We will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. This isn't something to be ashamed of. This is something that is evil and this is something that shouldn't have happened to me or to you or to anybody online, anybody listening. This is something that shouldn't have happened, period. There is no excuse. But know that there is nothing to feel shameful for. There is nothing to feel guilty for. It was not your fault. It doesn't matter the circumstance, what you are wearing. Go read Matthew 5, 29. It doesn't matter that you were at a party. It doesn't matter that you were drinking, that they were at your house, you were at their house. It doesn't matter, it shouldn't have happened. It's just something evil. But the Bible also tells us that he will take what the enemy has made for evil and turn it into good. This is your testimony. This is your testimony, the people that will be healed, regardless if it was abuse, whatever your testimony is. The enemy's gonna wanna keep you silent. He's gonna wanna keep you, the power of life and death is in our tongue. He's gonna wanna keep you silent. When you're speaking life, this is what I've been through, but this is what, this is where I was and this is where I am because of Jesus. That's life and the enemy doesn't want that. So if I can just encourage you today that Jesus is a healer, if he's done it for me, he's gonna do it for you. Speak your testimony. There's nothing to be ashamed of. All of, Your testimony is only going to glorify and edify the Lord. That's all it's gonna do. And so, 
Our worship team is about to worship and I believe we have prayer partners if they would like to come up. And we're just gonna take a moment to worship. We're just gonna take a moment to just think and just reflect and get some prayer. And please, if you have just anything, it doesn't even have to be abuse related. If you just need prayer for whatever, please come and get some prayer. Guys with guys, girls with girls. I'll be in the front as well. Um, thank you guys for hearing me and thank you for listening. Um, thank you guys. And just really quick, what a safe space. Please get prayer. The enemy's gonna rob you. He wants to rob you from even getting prayer because prayer is so powerful. Intercession is so powerful. But what a testament to what a safe space this is. All of these people who have shared their testimonies, these people who are on stage, these people who are small group leaders, what a testament to even what a safe space that is. So please, if you need any sort of prayer for anything, the altar is available. We love you guys so much. We are going to worship.
Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that, Lord, that relationships, family, Lord, this was your idea. Lord, the priority of it, it goes all the way back to, to the garden. It goes all the way back to Eden. And so, Lord, we know, Lord, that there's a, a place where we have to have you to have it right. We have to have you guiding to have relationships right, to have family right. But Lord, we also know that the enemy wants to disrupt it, wants to bring in these patterns of pain and brokenness these core places, Lord, where we, where families get disrupted, where identity is shaped. And Lord, we invite you here and now, Lord, to begin to bring a deeper place of healing in our hearts, a deeper place of alignment. Lord, everybody in this room, Lord, needs an adjustment on this space. Everybody in this room needs to understand in a little bit deeper way, Lord, how love, family, connections really function in a divine, life-giving way. Lord, we just invite you, Lord, to bring a place of healing. Every place where the enemy has come in and created wounds, created places where we want to pull back, where we feel like, Lord, that we can never ever have health in that area in the place of relationships in the place of family God I thank you Lord you're bringing in you're just breathing in fresh life right here right now Lord I thank you Lord for stirring vision Lord just as Josie spoke about 
what kind of family we want to have. Lord, you begin to speak into it. Lord, we bring down the lies that the enemy says this is what we have to settle for. We have to take whatever gets offered our direction because that's the best we'll ever do. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you're stirring fresh vision. Fresh vision for what our families are to look like. What your plan, Heavenly Father, your standards, your, your parameters, Heavenly Father. God, I thank you that you're at work right here, right now. Teaching us, reminding us, shaping us to what you have in store. Lord, I would just thank you for that. Lord, we also thank you, Lord, for healing. Healing in places of trauma. Places of hurt. Places where the enemies come in. May people feel reluctant to follow you in this area. God, I thank you, Lord, for just fresh vision, fresh healing. Thank you for it, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. We just thank you, Lord, that it is your goodness. You're the renewer. You're the restorer. You're the life giver. And you do it here. You do it now. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. prayer team will continue to be here. The altars will continue to be open. Obviously, there's something beautiful and restorative just about fellowship and connection. And so we, for those who want to slip into that part of this evening, and the, if you need an official dismissal, this is it. But these altars, this, this spirit of what the Holy Spirit is doing here, it's, it's going to linger as our worship team just continues to worship a little more.